So in uh, church on Sundays, what we've been doing is this series called Like a Child, and it kind of fits because on Christmas we're talking about a child being born. Now this was over, you know, 2,000 years ago, um, and yet when Jesus was born, he was a child. Jesus did not come full grown, like all of a sudden God didn't just zap him here, and just like all of a sudden he said, beam me down, dad, and no, that didn't happen. He was born. Jesus was born just like all of us, and this is the reason for it. God was like, hey, if I'm going to step into human creation, it's going to be like them and not just apart from them. Because if it came some, like, weird way, then we would be like, yeah, like, he's not really human. But you see, Jesus came just like us, a baby, an infant, just like a child. You know, our key verse uh, through this whole series has been as, as Jesus was in his earthly ministry and these little children were being brought to Jesus that Jesus might bless them. His disciples turned them away and said, Jesus doesn't have time for you. And it says that Jesus was indignant. Jesus was angry. And he says, let the little children come to me. For such belongs the kingdom of God. So as we've been looking back at this Like a Child series, we've been looking at things that we're going back to the very character of God. So this is Christmas. So once again, Merry Christmas. It, it's a great day to be able to celebrate. It's a great day to be able to rejoice because our God and Savior has been born. And yes, he's already been born over 2,000 years ago and we still celebrate today. So, this is where we're going to get to our word. If you got your Bibles, you're welcome to open it up. Luke chapter 1, we're going to start with 26 and start to, you know, so this part you didn't hear just a moment ago as Heather was reading through the Christmas story, but in Luke chapter 1, this is where we find when the first time that Mary is visited. 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee. To a virgin named Mary, she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But Mary, verse 29, it says, she was confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think what this angel could mean. So think about that for a moment. I mean, we always approach the Christmas story, and then we get to this Christmas story, and we get these angels that are start to appear. And you're like, just consider that for a moment, an angel appearing. Has anybody ever seen an angel? Like bright, shining angels? Anybody? Like, can you imagine the kind of response that you would usually get if you saw an angel that all of a sudden was standing before you bright shining like glorious and you're like I've never seen anything like this before this is the reason why whenever an angel appears usually the angel has to say these words do not be afraid (laughs) why because people are like What does this mean? It's the reason why when the angel appeared, Mary had said that she was disturbed. She was terrified. She's like, what is happening here? I don't even know what you're saying right now because there's an angel standing before me. Like, this isn't every day. This is something that the angel Gabriel, he's a deliverer angel. He's delivering a message to Mary. But Mary's still like, I don't understand it. I can't, I can't comprehend what you're trying to tell me. And so then we continue in the story, and this is where the angel says those words, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. 
Right? So there is the moment that always at Christmas time, and I put out another podcast on it just the other day, because I always have to remind everybody because the Christmas song says, Mary, did you know? And guess what? Mary knew! Like it's right here. It's like plain English. Mary knew exactly what Jesus was going to come to do. She knew what Jesus was going to be. She knew what Jesus was. She didn't think like, oh, like, yeah, virgins just conceive and have birth. Right? No, that doesn't happen. She's terrified, but she also hears the word from the angel and knows exactly why Jesus is there. But this is the reason why she follows it up in verse 34. She says, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. Right? That's a good question. No one's arguing like, yep, we're, we're, we like that question too. How did this happen? She's a virgin. And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the baby will be born, will be holy, and will be called the Son of God. So you find, and then verse 37, which um, has different translations, but I want you to be able to hear, um, this is actually one of the translations, as it says, for nothing is impossible with God. Or it says, for the word of God will never fail. So ultimately, it says the same thing. If God's saying it, it actually can happen. And this is where we get to our moment of teaching just like a child. We want to be able to receive today. Our God can do anything. This is where you're going to say it to a friend next to you. You're going to look towards somebody. Maybe look both directions if you'd like. Our God can do anything. Go ahead, say it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. You need to make sure everyone hears it. And we also need to make sure that we say it. Because sometimes we don't believe it. But we're talking about the omnipotence of God. Everybody heard that word before? Omnipotence. Right? It's never found in Scripture. But it is theology that comes from Scripture. You have heard where it says the Almighty is all-powerful. This is what omnipotence is. This is saying God is all-powerful. Meaning God has the power over everything. And this is the reason why he's almighty. He's almighty. He can do anything. And if God can do anything, then we should not ever doubt that God would say, hey, here is a virgin, and you're going to give birth to a son. And we're like, that doesn't happen. And God says, I can do anything. There are many people who are facing impossible challenges today. Impossible challenges. Things that you're looking at and saying, there is no possible way that I will ever be able to get over this hump. Someone once said this, and it's, uh, it's not the most cheerful Christmas cheer and joy phrase, but they, they say that you're either coming out of a challenge, you're in the middle of a challenge, or you're about ready to head into one. That's the stages of life. And so if you're facing something impossible, this is the reason why we need to go back like a child and understand the omnipotence, the all-powerful nature of God, because we can say that I can't see any way past this, but I know my God can do anything. There's nothing that can stop God. I can't see a way around it. I can't see past it. I can't see through it. But I know that God can do anything. Childlike faith. This is what childlike faith believes is that our God can. That if we believe that our God can, then there's nothing that we can't face. 
There's nothing that we can't say, this impossible thing, this impossible thing that I'm hitting right now, there's no way that this can change. There's no way that this can move. And God's like, oh, hold up. If we are going back to a childlike faith and saying, but I know that our God can do anything. Jeremiah chapter 32. We go back to the prophet. And then Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17, this is what uh, God says through the prophet. O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. So do, do you did you hear that? We need to go back and, and rephrase it, understand it a little bit more. Like, listen to what this is saying. Sovereign Lord, Almighty Lord, All-Powerful Lord. Why? And then it follows it up with, what did God do in His power? He created. He made the heavens and the earth. Your strong hand, your powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing. That means when you're looking at it and saying, but, no, like God's like, I got it covered. It says nothing. There isn't. You can't think of any single thing that God does not have power over. So when you're thinking about our God can, our God can save marriages, our God can help overcome addiction, our God can provide financially when you think that there's nothing left, our God can heal. Our God can reach people who do not currently follow Jesus. Our God can. And this is where we want to go back to that trust. And we're saying in faith we know that there's, yes, so many things in our life that we've seen things that go wrong. And we've seen people that are like, you know, butt their heads against a wall constantly because they can't find a way around. We've seen in life, and life has told us that there is impossible things. And when we, even if we are followers of Jesus, as even as we approach things, we start to be able to see, oh, well, I guess it's not going to happen. But what we say is our God will. People believe that God possibly can. People believe that God might. But usually when it comes to ourselves, we say, but it probably is not going to happen to me. It probably won't happen for me. You see, we are always looking because we have faced the challenges and maybe as we find even like years and years of facing the same thing again and again and again and we say, there's absolutely no possibility that there's ever going to be an end to this. Life teaches us that. And yet faith and childlike faith goes back to something that's even greater than that. And this is the reason why we have to be reminded of this. This is the reason why in our life when we're walking through challenges and difficulties and we're still going to say, but our God can and our God will. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is a passage as we're going to be talking about uh, David here just a little bit. So Matthew chapter 17, verse 45. Um, those of you who are familiar, when David is first introduced, and I'll just uh, give you a little bit of the background story. If you're not familiar with David, he's King David, the one that's mentioned in all of the, you know, you know Joseph was in the line of King David, and there was that whole thing, right? So King David, kind of a big deal in the Old Testament, Everybody like loved King David, went back to King David. King David was lifted up like he was, he was a great warrior, great king, all of this. The first time he's introduced, he's got a whole bunch of other bro- older brothers, and they're out fighting for Israel, or fighting for their country. And yet, David shows up, and he's like, wait a second, like, why are we afraid of these guys? So normally what would happen during battle, especially in this time, 
Not necessarily, it's not like this today. But if there were two countries that were fighting, usually they would take their strongest man and they would put them out there in the battlefield against the other team's strongest man. And they would say, now you guys are going to fight and whoever wins will then give us the victory for whatever side. So David and Israel, Israel's facing the Philistines. The Philistines had a giant on their team, which is the reason why the Philistines were like a powerhouse at the time, because if you tried to go against a giant, chances are you weren't going to have the strength in order to overpower a giant. And yet David, he's like, as the scriptures explain him, describe him, he's like a little guy. He's a kid. He's delivering lunch to his brothers on the battlefield, and all of the Israelites are hiding because nobody wants to face the giant. And David's like, what's going on, guys? Like, this guy's out here, and he's taunting us, and he's basically, like, trashing God. Like, you're okay with this? This is not good. Why are you doing this? So when we get to our passage, in verse 45 of uh, chapter 17, David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's army, the God of the armies of Israel whom you defiled. Today, the Lord will conquer you. Why is it that they had a whole army of grown folks, people who were, you know, have gone through battles before, who have stood up to other nations, and yet stand terrified right now? And it takes a child, a boy, Not even yet a man who comes and says, the God of heaven's armies, the same heaven's armies that we actually just heard from in the scriptures in Luke chapter 2, when the heaven's armies came and they stood there because they were all rejoicing over the birth of Jesus, it was the same heaven's armies that there was there with David. David believed that our God could do anything. Because there was a giant that stood before David, and yet David had a a slingshot, a couple of stones. He flung it in the air. He hit the, the, the giant Goliath right between the eyes. Knocked him over. He chopped off his head. That's the brutal parts of Scripture that you don't always find in the David and Goliath story. But he cut off his head. That was customary because then it was paraded before the Philistines as they knew that they lost. God can do anything. And it's through God that all things are possible. We don't have to think about it in terms of what we can think about always limitations. We never have enough. We don't have this. We don't have this. And God's like, you have everything. I can do anything. But what do you do when you know that God can and you believe that God will, but then God doesn't? That's a tough one, right? Let me take you back to Mary and Joseph, Mary and Jesus. When your children are born, like you love your children like so much that it hurts. You love your children so much because you want to see them grow, you want to see them flourish, you want to see them do all kinds of things that you could never do. 
Right? You always want the best for these children. Mary was not like anybody else, she, but she looked at Jesus and it was the same thing. But you guess what Jesus, she already knew what Jesus had to do. She knew that Jesus was born so that he was going to die. She knew that he was going to be the savior of the world. And yet she, yet at the same time, when it came back down to that spot, when Jesus was being going to the cross, and she knew it, she wanted him to not do it. She said, Jesus, you, know, you don't have to do this. You see those moments that even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane comes before his Father and says, if there's any other possible way around this, let this cup pass from me. Some people perceive this as Jesus not wanting to die for the sins of the whole world. No, Jesus is saying, but if there's any other way, right, let this cup pass from me. And you see what happens is, is that Jesus is taken to the cross. That Jesus dies. And you see Mary probably even prayed to God and said, God, can you not kill him? God, if there's any other way, can we, we, we kind of make this? I know you declared it way back before he was even born, but if there's any other way, God, can you make that happen? And she probably believed that God could and that God would. But God didn't. And this is where we have to go back to our reliance and a strong faith in who God is. Because there's those times and those things that we are going to say, God, I know that you can and I know that you will, but sometimes God doesn't and you've got to say, why? And we might be frustrated, but we also have to believe that our God knows more than we do. That God's ways are higher than our ways. That God's thoughts are greater than our thoughts. And we have to say, God, I'm still going to trust you through the trial. Because I know that you're already going to still be with me. Let me give you one example of this. Um, I call them Rack, Shack, and Benny, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is in the book of Daniel. And this is where um, uh, these guys are Israelites, and they've been taken into exile. And so they're living in a foreign land, and these are also kids. Now, some people don't, haven't, you know, aren't reminded of that. Even Daniel himself was a young kid when he went into exile. They were all young kids. Probably on the verge of like teenagers, but yet at the same time, you know that like you still have a lot of life to learn and live. So as a kid, as a, even as a young, young person, you're still trying to be able to figure things out. These people came before the king, and the king told them, hey, you can't, uh, you can't worship anything else. What you need to do is bow down. I've got this statue of me. And the king always believed, the kings in, in the Old Testament always believed that they were deity. They were like pretty much God. And that's the reason why he said, so Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego, this is what you're going to do. You're going to bow down to me and worship me only. You can't worship God. And then they said, No. And the king said, all right, I'm going to give you some more opportunities because if you don't do it, I'm going to throw you into the fire. And the fire is going to burn you up. It's going to consume you. And so we go to Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 3. Um, and you can always go back to this story. It's, uh, it's, it is, it's a great story um, that's in there. But we, what we see is, is their kind of response to the king at this point in time. So 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. 
If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. Remember, our God can. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And this is, this is the key part, verse 18. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you've set up. Do you see, they, in faith, said to this king, we're not going to do what you're gonna, you're, you want. And even if you throw us in there, our God can save us from the furnace. Our God will save us from the furnace. And but, he says, but even if he doesn't. And that's a line of faith. Even if he doesn't. We're never going to do what you want us to do. Because our God is with us. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. And it says that there was one who stood before them in the fire. Now some people look at this. This is kind of like Jesus before he was born in flesh. This was Jesus who stood in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Jesus stood in the fire and didn't allow them to be consumed. And when they looked into the fire, they're like, but they're not burning up. Let them out. And they walked out. God could. God did. The most thing is we look at Christmas, nothing is more impossible than God taking on flesh and becoming one of us. God, right? God had the riches of heaven. Jesus, the fullness of love, of grace, of forgiveness, all of those wonderful things of joy and peace. God had the fullness of it. Jesus was experiencing it, and yet he gave this up for the brokenness of this world. And you know what I mean when we're looking at brokenness today. When we had a man in his 20s just last week shot and killed street over. Where somebody went to the mall out in Oak Brook and shot four people to death. This is the level of brokenness that we're talking about. That Jesus didn't just say, I'm going to leave them there because I don't want to deal with that mess. But Jesus says, I'm going to step into your brokenness. I'm going to become one of you. Because this was the only way that God could save us. Christmas reminds us that God loves us deeply. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Merry Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen.